joining us for this episode of Read, Return, Repeat, a Read ICT podcast. This episode is titled, No Place Like Home. I'm Sarah Dixon. And I'm Daniel Peewee Wardy. Today's episode, which is the final episode of our second season, we are talking about Category 12, an author visiting Wichita in 2022. With us today is Silas House, an author who was here in Wichita back in October. Silas is a nationally best-selling author, music journalist, columnist, and environmental activist. He was born and raised and currently lives in rural Kentucky and is known for writing fiction that focuses on the natural world, working class characters, and the plight of rural communities and rural people. His last novel, Lark Ascending, published in September, was an immediate indie bestseller and a finalist for the Southern Book Award. We are very excited to have him here with us to wrap up season two of the podcast. Welcome, Silas. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so awesome to meet you. Thank you. Daniel, I both really liked your book, Lark Ascending. That's good to hear. Yeah, that's great. I, yeah, the, I'm a big dog person. So yeah, it's like one of my favorite dog reads in a while. So yes, yeah. we were we were a little bit concerned about how that was going to end up. Um, so we, we won't give away any spoilers to our listeners, but uh, it is a good dog book. It's a good dog book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have been telling readers just because some people are afraid to read it. because <laughs> the, dog, the dog does not get killed. OK. <laughs> But but it does take place over a long period of time, and we all know dogs don't don't live long enough. But the dog is not killed. <laughs> <laughs> we um we actually did our own spoiler alert. I have to say because we Daniel and I are both are big dog people, and um may not have been able to finish it if I didn't know that. Yeah, I knew we could get that out all day. <laughs> so. Um, but before we go too far, um, Silas, can you tell your, our listeners a little bit about your newest book in case they haven't read it yet? Because it just came out, what, in October, right? Late September. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you give them a brief overview? Well, it takes place about 20 years in the future and <clears throat> uh, a, a climate catastrophe has is happening in the United States. and sort of this fundamentalist insurrectionist uh, group has used the climate catastrophe to take control of the government. So uh, the book centers on Lark and his family who are sort of representative of you know most Americans and they're on the run from these forest fires and from this sort of new regime that wants everybody to, to live only one way according to their rules. And so they uh, eventually found themselves on a crowded refugee boat headed for Ireland. And um, once there, Lark walks across Ireland with a dog and they're seeking a place of sanctuary. So to me, the book is very much about community, uh, created family and blood family. Um, it's a uh, the book is a lot about grief, not only grieving the loss of people who you love, but grieving the loss of your country. Um, when I was writing the book, I was sort of drawing on what was happening in my own life. I lost my aunt, who was a third parent to me, very mm -hmm. close to me, and I, so I was just in deep grief. <clears throat> At the same time, for many years now, I've been feeling as if I'm losing the country that I've known, um, all of the hatred and vitriol, there was a real demise of our democracy. Just, you know, these waves of sadness that keep hitting us as a people. And so I wanted to write about that and have, you know, a few characters who could represent that experience that a lot of us have been going through. That definitely comes out uh, in the book, that's, I'm, I'm glad to know where you're where you were coming from with it because I think it does kind of inform um how I think I understand it a little bit better uh yeah but definitely all those themes are present the loss of country I don't think I, I thought too much about but yeah like thinking back that is a big part of it and things and um 
So in the book, and speaking of like loss of country in the book, the characters are American and they immigrate to Ireland to escape the circumstance, circumstances back home. Why did you choose Ireland as a refuge for your characters? Well, it makes logistical sense in this sort of climate crisis scenario, you know, because in this in my climate crisis scenario, the world has been overtaken by wildfires. And that's sort of rooted in a few years ago when Australia, you know, such a large portion of Australia burned. And it made me think about, it made me think about how easily that could happen in other places. I read that a billion animals died in the Australia fires. And that was just so overwhelming that I, I wanted to write about it. Um, and so, you know, if if this were to happen, and this is one of the climate projections that could happen, Ireland would be one of the places that was safe from that sort of thing, you know, just because of the way the uh, the jet stream and the climate and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so that combined with the fact that I know Ireland really well, I don't like to write about a place unless I feel I've really been immersed in it and understand it culturally and historically and you know and and have real experience with it uh, i thought it also worked well thematically because ireland is a place that has been fighting for its autonomy for centuries and in this scenario you know americans are fighting um against these opposing forces that want to take away you know the roots of all the freedoms that we hold so dear. So it worked. It just, you know, it works on lots of levels. Uh, I like the idea of Glendalo in the book, in the story. Um, like not just being as like, cause given its history and like the whole idea of it being a thin place. And I, I thought it was better that it took place in Ireland. If that like with that being kind of like the utopian like place to go, because I feel like the American surrogate of that place would be Sedona, Arizona. And I was like, it's way more romantic that this book that takes place in Ireland and they're going to this place called Glendalo. Um, do you have a Glendalo in in your own life? Some utopia. Once we're, once you are there, you know everything will be all right. Is there a place like that for you? Um. Well, I mean, I have a favorite place. I grew up near this lake, Del Hollow Lake, and it's just the place where I feel most at peace. And there's just a sense of timelessness there. There are thin places throughout the world, and you know, you name Sedona. That's definitely one that people, a lot of people, there's a consensus that Sedona is a thin place. A thin place meaning a place where it feels like the veil is thinner between the natural world and the supernatural world. Um, <clears throat> some people might say that the world, the veil is thinner between our world and heaven, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Um, but there are power places, you know. I think the one that I have felt most strongly is Glendalock, which is a real place. Oh, Glendalock. And, Glendalock. Yeah. And thank you. Um, people throughout the world feel that way about Glendalock, and um, some people think it's because there are mineral deposits under it. Some people think it's because people have been, been praying there consistently for thirteen hundred years. You know, who knows why. Um, but when you're there, you can feel it. It's a powerful place. Well, I looked it up um, while I was reading it because he it's this, you know, most uh, this one point where if he can just get to Glendalock, um, you know, everything's everything's going to be OK. So I looked it up and then I was able to. It's beautiful. Um, I've never been to Ireland, but like it looks like what I would imagine a refuge would look like. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> I just did an Instagram post all about it today. So if anybody okay. else is on Instagram, I'm uh, you can find me on there. And um, I, I did a post of a few pictures of it. And um, it's a place that I revisit a lot. You know, um, I, I think about it a lot. I think once you go to Ireland and really experience it, um, you think about it. All the time, you know, having traveled there a few times, you just never get over it. 
Um, okay. I want to ask about the dog. I know we talked a little bit about it just as we were getting started. Now that people have a better feel for what they can expect out of your book. Um, after Lark arrives in Ireland, we're introduced to this wonderful beagle named Seamus. Uh, we get to learn a little bit more about him. I found it particularly interesting that after such a dark passage on that overcrowded boat crossing the you know Atlantic and all of the treachery or treachery, but all of the danger and like people are dying. It's, it's very dark. Um, and then we switch over to this like beautiful little dog who's experiencing life and he's chasing seagulls and he gets to live out, you know, with his, with his man friend that's on the I Ireland, um, uh, on the Island. So it's, it was very interesting that it was so different, right? You're so dark, dark, dark. And then we switch over and it's, innocent and pure um what did Seamus represent in the story well I think you know it's very much by design you've hit the nail right on the head is it's a dark story there's a lot of necessary violence in the book um and Seamus inserts some joy into the book and some light and some hope and, you know, when Lark is at his lowest, he's all alone. And it takes him a long time to trust the other main character that he encounters in Ireland, Helen. I mean, it's pretty much right up to the end before they can really trust each other. But he can trust Seamus right from the get-go. And so Seamus, you know, represents a lot of hope for him, hope in humanity. I always felt like Lark's main uh, driving force is that he wants to be able to survive these extraordinary circumstances by, while also retaining his humanity. And I think Seamus reminds him of his own humanity and his own empathy. And, you know, Seamus brings up the best in him in a really, uh, in a, a really trying time. And also, you know, as far as we know, dogs are not aware of their impending demise the way we are. Mm -hmm. And so they're um, not, you know, having these existential crises in the midst of apocalypse, <laughs> the way Lark is. And so it does give some balance to the darkness and the light. Well, and, mission accomplished. I thought it was great. Yeah, I love, I, dogs. I love writing about dogs. You know, um, of course, in writing about a dog, I had to focus a lot on the sense of smell. It's mm -hmm. a very olfactory book. And so what I decided to do was, when I'm writing from Seamus's point of view, I'm relying a lot on aromas, but I also decided to do that when I'm writing from Lark's point of view as well. So for instance, <clears throat> the aroma of cedar is something that Lark is thinking about throughout the book. And it's a scent that, you know, most of us can conjure that scent for ourselves, that muskiness and all that. Um, and so they're, you know, it's sort of a parallel for these two characters to to have that overwhelming scent uh, it's actually the, my favorite story, favorite line in the book i wrote it down and it was about how if as long as there are dogs and cedar smells like i guess it's all right we'll just keep going yeah so i thought that was that I, moved me I, um not as moving but i did like i liked when you talk about uh Sh seamus and he's like smelling and he's like checking where the entrails were that were eaten to see if he's still had it. I was like, that's really accurate because dogs totally do that. They will go back to the same spot. I was like really impressed with the detail of that. <laughs> well, yeah, I have a beagle. He's asleep right here behind me. And so, I, you know, I've really studied him. And, you know, they, beagles especially, love uh, smells of things that we consider disgusting. You know, like oh. he, he finds a big pile of, you know, fox manure, he's going to want to roll around in it. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Lark Ascending does a really good job of exploring humanity during a time of crisis. It also seems to reflect the worst fears of what could happen if political extremism and climate catastrophe were to go unchecked. What inspired you to explore such a heavy topic? I tend to write about what I'm worried about or what I have a question about. There have been lots of times over the last few years that I've felt pretty hopeless. And so I wanted to write a book where things are as bad as they can get 
Yet, the main character is holding on to hope. And it was a way for me to conjure hope for myself in a really sad time. Not only for myself personally, losing my aunt, but also witnessing, you know, the demise of so much of our American way of life. You know, a not only, you know, what I see as a real demise of the democracy, but also a fundamental shift in our ethics. What is considered acceptable behavior? Um, you know, whether that be like people in the highest points of power openly making fun of a disabled person or being openly racist or transphobic or homophobic, you know, openly bigoted in a way that people at least tried to hide that for a while. <laughs> you know, it, it never went away, of course, the bigotry. But there was a while where it wasn't so acceptable to be open about, you know, and now you're seeing it in the, you know, from, you know, the most visible politicians and uh, celebrities and et cetera. And I just think that's terribly sad. And so I'm grieving for that as well. You know, um, I'm not sure I answered the question. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. It's fine. I honestly, I think we kind of addressed it a little bit yeah. earlier when you were talking about your inspiration for writing the the book. They they go hand in hand. Um, um, I did want, kind of want to ask more about the apocalypse itself in your book. Lark Ascending shows you an ecological collapse. Uh, the characters in Dora, that seems very real, like very like real. Uh, I actually had nightmares after reading it a little bit, which is fine. I mean, that's part of experiencing. You've written a lot about climate science and have been a vocal advocate against mountaintop removal mining and, for, you know, advocating for the existence of global warming and other ecological harms. What were some of your influences, books, documentaries for your version of the apocalypse? Like, was there anything that you looked at, like, directly on how things would happen if things keep going the way they are? I looked at scientific studies and, you know, projections for different things that could happen. I've been really inspired by writers like Wendell Berry and Barbara Kingsolver. You know, Barbara Kingsolver wrote a book about climate change years and years ago called Flight Behavior, like way before it was part of the national conversation. Um, that book was a warning, you know, and so... There's just so many, also just so many people fighting for the environment, uh, people we know, you know, really well, like Greta Thunberg, or, you know, just people in their local, you know, some little small town who's standing up and fighting back against environmental devastation. So I'm I'm really inspired by all those people, from the really well-known to the people you never hear about. In a way, I'm more inspired by the people you never hear about. You know, I think that most of these movements really the real progress is made by the people behind the scenes. Um, and so I, you know, I was just looking at a lot of that and thinking about the way that just everyday working class people are the ones who, and people in deep poverty are the ones who pay the real price in climate mm -hmm. change, you know, and when, when these huge climate migrations happen in, in bigger ways, it will, of course, affect the poorest people the most. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about that. I like the part in your book where you talked about how it's the few, a few, like, they say we, like, destroyed our world, but I don't believe that it's a few, and then it's the rest that'll, like, and I, I the, 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 the facts and things point to that. And so like, that's kind of like an interesting point of view you don't typically see because everyone thinks that, hey, if we all recycle or whatever, and like, yeah, I think that's interesting about like pollution and things, so. Yeah, I think so many of us just feel so powerless, you know, in the face of so much widespread destruction that we're not participating in. And even like when we're trying to make a difference by, mm -hmm turning off our lights or recycling or whatever. It's just such a huge entity that we're up against. There's still giant fires in, you know, California, but yeah. turning off your lights is probably not going to make a huge difference against. So, um, yeah. 
It's dark, but don't worry, there's dogs. <laughs> um, go ahead. I was just going to say, I did also, you know, I did try to inject lots of moments of beauty in the book, too, to balance that out. Mm-hmm. Also, to sort of go, my main theme was, as long as hope remains, you can keep going. You know, if you can just have that glimmer of hope, that's what carries us through. And that's one thing that I really learned by experiencing profound grief is you get through profound grief by thinking, if I can just make it through this moment where I feel so hopeless, if I can just make it through this, I can keep going, you know, so it's like one step at a time. It's sort of like I quit smoking 15 years ago, such an incredibly hard thing to do. And the way I did it was every time I would have a craving, you know, these incredible cravings that just take your control away, I would think, if I can push through this one craving, the next one will be just a tiny little bit easier. And they'll keep accruing until finally one will be easy to get through. You know, it's that sort of thinking. Um, And so as much as I was thinking about grief, I was also thinking about hope and beauty. So, you know, he's in the middle of the ocean and things seem pretty hopeless, but then he sees this incredibly blue sky and he thinks, you know, everything can't be terrible and a total loss when there's still such beauty in the world to witness, you know, and also the fact that that beauty keeps going in the midst of such turmoil, you know, that that the world keeps going on, that that conjures some hope for him as well. Yeah, that passage was just pretty dark. I don't even remember the blue sky, but I do remember that he, well, we won't give away all the plot points of the book. Suffice to say, it's worth reading if you haven't figured that out by now. But let's talk about the poetry in the book, because I feel like that was also a big a kind of thread that weaves through the whole thing. Um, the title comes from a poem by George Meredith, which you talk a little bit about um, in the book, and then which was an inspiration by a song for a song by Robert William Vaughn Williams. Um, and then you use po- quotes from Yeats and Seamus Haney is presumably the inspiration for the dog's name. So, um, well, and I'll just say, like, I think that the writing itself is rather poetic. Um, and so why do you think poetry is so important in this apocalypse? Well, for one one thing, you can't think about Ireland without thinking about poetry because it's such a bastion of poetry and you know probably the most beloved contemporary poet is Seamus Haney who died pretty recently and then one of the main poets that shaped the 20th century was Yeats so both of them being Irish and both of them also writing a lot about trouble and apocalypse and things like that you know it just made sense at the same time, any time that I am working on a novel, one way that I sort of build the novel's world for myself is that I find poetry that feeds that novel. So, for instance, my last novel was set mostly in Key West. So I read a lot of poetry that's about Key West or was written mm-hmm. in Key West. You know, it helps me to build the world that I'm writing it within. It also is an easy way for me to get into the book. So let's say that I want to sit down to write a scene set in the Irish countryside. I'll read a poem by an Irish poet about the Irish countryside, and it just puts me in the right mind space, you know. And so then I just like to have those little allusions to the poetry that has served me as a writer. Um, So all of those reasons. The other thing that I use a lot of is music. Yes, um, I use a lot of musical references to build that world as well. So the main theme for this book, music wise, is the title of the book, the the Lark Ascending, which is a fourteen minute one movement piece of classical music, transcendent, one of the most incredibly emotional pieces of music ever written. Um, but also, you know, the characters are thinking about REM and U two and John Prine and. Brandy Carlisle and Adele. And yeah, I was thinking a lot about <clears throat> this is a post-electric world, you know, so they don't have any way of playing recorded music. All mm-hmm. 
music is just what they play on instruments or they're singing. And so I thought, what songs right now would people maybe still know 20 years from now, you know, when they're sitting around a fire? And so that's why somebody sings like um, Someone Like You by Dale mm -hmm. or The Story by Brandy Carlisle or Angel from Montgomery by John Prine. You know, these are songs that I hear people singing all the time at gatherings and I, I, that I think will carry on. And it also just thematically or tonally, it, it, it creates the world for you as the reader. And you feel like you can sort of hear the world as well as, you know, know about it when you get those references. I like the YouTube playlist you made. That was kind of this Lark Ascending soundtrack. I, I went through that. Yeah. 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 I hope everybody will look. I have a YouTube channel. It's just Silas House. And the playlist for Lark is on there. Cool. I did not know that that was the thing. So I'll definitely. Yeah. It's, it yeah. I've been noticing a lot more. Spotify does a good job of making novel soundtracks, but it was cool <laughs> when it actually came from the author. I was like, oh, that's cool. That's really neat. Um, well, if you will bear with us, we're going to take a short break. Um, and then when we come back, we have a lot more to dive into with Silas House on Read, Return, Repeat. All right. Did you know that the Wichita Public Library has a wealth of local history resources that you can use? From old yearbooks to newspaper archives to genealogy databases, you can find it all here. Located on the second floor of the Advanced Learning Library, our knowledgeable staff can help you with every task, from finding newspaper articles that made Wichita history to researching your family tree. For more information, visit wichitalibrary.org forward slash research slash local history. All right, and we're back. Thank you Welcome so much back. again to Silas House for joining us, author of Lark Ascending. We're having a great time, but let's yeah. let's transition more into like a broad spectrum of Southern writing. Yeah. Um, so you're you're often considered a Southern writer. Uh, a lot of your books take place in the South, particularly Appalachia, where the setting is just as much a character as the protagonist. Lark Ascending is the first novel you've written that isn't set in the region. What was it like moving out of your literary comfort zone? Is it Appalachia or Appalachia? Isn't that supposed to be like a dialectal thing? It's according to where you're from. Okay. <laughs> if you're from uh, central or southern Appalachia, you tend to say like latch instead of lace. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. So I would say Appalachia, but it's, I don't think it's incorrect, however you say it. Okay. Um, I forgot the question. I'm, I'm sorry. so sorry. <laughs> uh, how was it writing a book, having a book take place like outside of that area, the area that you you live like in? I don't, you know, I don't, I didn't even think about that because I'm, mm. I'm familiar, you know, with so many different places. My first three books are very much set right where I grew up. Um, and so I don't think I'll ever run out of things to write about the place I'm from, but I also want to write about other places that I know well, you know, um, I guess what's different about it is talking about it more so because when people have a lot of questions, Appalachia is a really misunderstood place. And so when you write a novel about it, people tend to have a lot of questions about it, you know, things they didn't quite understand or vernacular questions. And that's one of the main things, you know, not writing about it. I'm not using as much vernacular uh, like that I grew up, what I would call home language, you know, and things like that. So I did, <clears throat> even though I've been to Ireland a lot and all that were for Lark Ascendant, I had to consult Irish friends to make sure I was getting the vernacular right because, you know, unless you have lived somewhere a long time, you run the risk of not getting it right and just getting it a little bit wrong can come off as really, really bad. Yeah. You know, um, with that said, Appalachian culture is a thread of three cultures, Native American, African, and Scots-Irish. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of similarities between Irish culture and Appalachian culture, you know, that I use in the book. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, that's interesting to think about. I guess I, I had never like, well, I'm from Kansas and I know very little of the Appalachian culture except for um, some music, uh-huh. right? Bluegrass and stuff comes out of there, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, no? Yes? Yeah. Sort of? I kind of I kind of know Appalachian, like, uh, <laughs> so I, I, my family lives in Nova, Northern Virginia, so we've driven through Appalachia a lot and like... I have some experience with it and stuff. And yeah, it's it's the, it's my favorite part of the trip. Once we hit like once we like hop through like there's like a like yeah, like once we get past St. Louis and then it's just like we normally hit it at night. It's it's kind of a really cool nighttime track. So, hmm. Yeah. Um speaking of regional writing and authors, uh who are some regional authors that you might recommend to our listeners who are not familiar with the genre? You mean the South? Um, I think because isn't that a th- we looked it up and there's a genre for regional authors for people who write about a region specifically, um, where you do with the South. So yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? Well, I mean, the writer who really sh- was shaped me so much as a young writer who's Appalachian regional writing would be Lee Smith, L E E Smith. She wrote one of the best novels of the last 100 years. It's called Fair and Tender Ladies, a beautiful epistolary novel. Some people might call Willa Cather a regional author. You know, she's uh, mostly known for Nebraska. Um, Her novel, My Antony, is one of my favorite novels ever. But she also wrote, you know, a great novel set in the Southwest called Death Comes for the Archbishop. So she sort of moved around from region to region as well. Um, I feel like as a plain state, we kind of claim Willa Cather as well, even though she is from Nebraska. But I feel like the first author I think of with Kansas is Sarah Smarsh. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, for a contemporary, that's who I most identify with Kansas. Who would be the other ones like Kansans? Well, I didn't expect for the question to get turned around on me. Uh, Who wrote the Heart of uh, Heart of Junk book? That one kind of picked up uh, about the. Oh, I, we were going to read that for my book club, and then yeah. we didn't. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, Zach, Zach McDermott, I guess counts. We had him on the show. Had that book, uh, Grill and the Bear, was uh, as has takes up place a lot in Wichita. So. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, yeah. Ben Lerner, the Topeka School. Oh, the Topeka School. Uh huh. Know that one anyway yeah i mean yeah, i'm uh, not great at off that top of my i can yeah. name oklahoma authors up like in, in scott nominees from my hometown mm-hmm. i'm from Watton, oklahoma uh you know like yeah. Tol- uh, tulsa has um the lady that wrote the outsiders and oh is he hidden yeah yeah yeah. Yes. yeah um so you, you you're a country music fan and I, like uh, <laughs> Um, you've written, uh, you, I saw a lot of interviews with like Tyler Childers and other country artists. And I've actually just been going through and listening to a lot of country music. So I was like, oh, this is great research for me. Cause I get to listen to like, um, and you've also like, um, like you've also written, are you, I've seen, I saw, did you, do you perform or write songs? A little bit of both. Yeah. yeah. I saw that you did something for the, the South can, I I don't know what area it is, but like where Paducah is at when they got hit by storms really bad. I saw you perform. I had a friend that put from that lives in Paducah, so that was really cool that you helped with the fundraising efforts there. And um, anyway, so you're you're a country music fan. You you mentioned a lot of country music in the book, or a little bit John Prine in your most recent book. Uh, do you? Uh, there's a lot of storytelling aspects with country. Um, do you feel that influences your writing at all? And what is your favorite country music ballad? Oh, I, I mean, I totally grew up on country music. Uh, my aunt that I s- talked about earlier, she had, you know, every record you could buy country music. And I really came up on people like Don Williams. He's one of my favorites. And, you know, maybe my favorite country ballad is by him, you know, um, Lord, I hope this day is good by Don Williams. Of course, I love Loretta Lynn. If you're watching this on video, you can see behind me a Loretta Lynn sign. I'm wearing a Dolly Parton shirt. <laughs> and I was raised right between 
where they were raised, like halfway between both of them is where I was raised. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, Patty Loveless, Trisha Yearwood. I love a lot of 90s country, especially. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, Reba was just here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Keith Willie, Dwight Yoakam, Amy Lou Harris. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Just, you know, uh, Brooks and Dunn. I, I love a lot of those. The the country artists that I like more now tend to be the ones you don't hear on the radio as much. They're more like Americana artists, you know. Um, people like Tyler Childers that you mentioned. I think he's doing amazing work. Um, just such smart songwriting. Great play picking. Um, Charlie Crockett is from Texas. He's one of my favorites right now. Look him up if you love good classic country music. Um, so I mean, we can include those in the show notes, yeah. I think, um, for right. Stylus House Recommends Country Music. I just, you know, I grew up listening to the Grand Ole Opry. And the first time I went to the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, I was in tears. Every time I'm in there, I still get emotional because it just meant so much to my family. And we felt represented by country music in a way that we weren't represented in, on TV or in the movies, you know, as rural people. Country music was the one thing in media that gave us some real complexity and didn't just make caricatures of us. Yeah, um, I grew up watching, uh, from a band from Southwest Oklahoma, like I have mixed feelings about a lot of the like rep my, my friends like love King of the Hill. Yeah, I feel like King of the Hill did a pretty good job of representation, but there was like how they represented Oklahoma in particular. It's like I was like those episodes I'm just not a fan of, but I grew up watching TNN and like Crook and Chase in the morning. So like that, that's kind of how like you sure. that, I don't think people think about that as for for like Southern representation, how, how important that channel was. <laughs> Um, so in the wake of COVID-19, uh, we've seen a lot of decentralization of, um, this is totally switching gears, by the way, um, but a lot of decentralization of industries with people working from home and they're migrating out of big cities like New York and Los Angeles to less crowded and more affordable places like Appalachia, Appalachia. Um, so I saw, like, I saw one where people were being offered like $10,000 to move to West Virginia for like two years and they had one community. And then a couple of years later, they had another community. So I'm just wondering if you're seeing that there and where you're from, um, do you think that this will, what kind of changes would that have on the culture of Appalachia? Well, I mean, I'm not seeing that first okay. of all, where I'm from, uh, there's a, a a great exodus happening right now. Some of that is because we had really historic flooding last summer. Um, we, we've had some pretty catastrophic weather events over the last few years. Um, we're seeing the effects of climate change here, you know. But some projections say that places like Appalachia will be a, a place of refuge during the climate crisis. So, you know, it could go either way. Um, I think, you know, we're in a real transitional place with our economy. Mm -hmm. coal, coal mining is no more the way it used to be. And so for, lo for so long, it supported a lot of our economy. And so the, the region is really trying to find ways to transition economically. And it's an uphill battle. Okay. Yeah. It's <laughs> just, we, we, we were seeing it there. Oh, so sorry. Yeah. Okay. We're dealing with that too. Like rural Kansas, the agriculture is shrinking. Mm -hmm. Not so much climate change, but just kind of like factory farming. But I think it is also climate yeah, change. I mean, climate change. We're in a severe drought. We have been for yeah. years and years. And yeah. so you're seeing like schools close and kids have, like it's yeah. It seems like that's a part of like rural America is just like shrinking. Um, and you did visit Wichita recently yeah. to promote Lark Ascending. What'd you think? Was there anything about Wichita that surprised you? Did you have a chance to check out any of the local sites? Well, I got I was there for like 16 hours total, so I didn't. <laughs> get um, I stayed at a, a hotel right on the river, so I, I walked on the river, and I loved that. It was um, I you know I'd never been to Kansas 
before. And I just, uh, I ate at a couple of local places that were really great. And Where'd you go? I can't remember now. Okay. <laughs> but I had dinner at the place. It's right across from Watermark's bookstore. Mm-hmm. That's the wine uh, dive? Yeah. Wine dive? Okay. It was excellent. And, um, you know, the bookstore there is just one of the best in the country. And I just loved being there. Such a great staff. And, um just such a beautiful bookstore, so well curated, made me feel so welcome. So uh, I would just appreciate all the hospitality. Everybody was wonderful. So good, yeah, awesome. Uh, well, next time you visit, you'll have to come to the library so we can uh, you show a, you around. Yeah, give you a big old tour. And we've got uh, we've actually got a history walk tour that you can do right there um, along Main Street. Well, not Main Street, Douglas Avenue, but. Yeah. All intents and purposes, it's Main Street. Most of book tour is, you know, you fly in, you go to your hotel, you go to the bookstore, you eat, you go to the hotel, you go to the airport. So you get to go to all these wonderful places that you don't get to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, um, we are very happy about Wichita and we can tell you all the great places to go. So when you're ready to visit for fun. Yeah, for funsies. Uh-huh. We'll we'll make an itinerary for you. I'm just kidding. We won't do that. We'll let you explore it on your own. Uh, okay, so I think we have one more time. Um, we have time for about for one more question, and we just wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, shout out any other projects you're working on, um, where our listeners can go to check out more of your work. You had mentioned a YouTube channel. Um, Daniel and I found several articles that we'll include in the show notes that you wrote. Um, are there any other things that you want to give a shout out to? Um, I just had an essay that came out in Time magazine. So if you go to Time and just enter my name, you'll that'll come up. Um, next week I have a piece coming out in um, a magazine called Lit Hub, L I T H U B, and it's about talking about grief on book tour and how much audiences have talked to me about their own grief. At not only losing people, but also that sort of national sense of grief that so many of us have felt for the last few years. And particularly the way the pandemic shaped grief, like family members dying alone because of COVID, not being able to have, you know, memorial services because of COVID, mm-hmm. things like that. I think it's a real paradigm shift in the way that we grieve was caused by the pandemic. And so I'm, I'm writing a little bit about that. Um, there we're getting really close on the film of my last novel, Southernmost. So everybody send good vibes out to Hollywood that that happens because they're casting right now. Okay. But, you know, you never know until it's on the screen if it's really going to happen or not. But I'm really the script is beautiful, and so I've been working pretty closely with them on that. I didn't write the script; somebody else did. But um. I've been lucky that they've included me in the process. So that's the main thing that I'm thinking about right now. I'm putting together a collection of short stories that I hope will be published. I'm always working on short stories. And um, those are the main things, yeah. Okay, awesome. That's awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us for this is actually in our last episode of season two. Um, and so we're really excited that you could be our author who visited Wichita, even if it was only for 16 hours. Yeah, so thank you so much for being a part of our season finale. (laughs) I can't thank y'all enough for spending time with the book. I really appreciate it. Stretch your legs while learning about Wichita's rich history with the Wichita History Walk. Download the Pocket Sites app and experience a guided audio tour of local landmarks that can be enjoyed at your own pace. The tour features three routes, Wild West Delano, Historic Downtown, and East Douglas Heritage. The Pocket Sites app is available for free on both Android and iOS. Download the app today and start exploring. And now, here are a few staff recommendations for Category 12, a book by an author visiting Wichita or hosted remotely by a Wichita organization. 
Hi, I'm Connie from Circulation and Interlibrary Loan. I read Devil House by John Darnielle, who visited Wichita in February for Category 12, author visiting Wichita. I thought that this would be a horror story because of the cover and the title, but it wasn't. Devil House is about a true crime author who has had some success in the past. He is given a lead by his agent on this house for sale in California, the Devil House, where a supposedly satanic double murder took place in the 80s. He moves into the house that had been an adult video store to immerse himself in the crime and do extensive research. I liked how it became more about what is the truth, how true is true crime. Everyone has a story, how much of it is real. If you enjoy true crime, you might like this one. This has been my recommendation for Category 12. For more reading recommendations, go to wichitalibrary.org slash read ICT. My name is Jenny. I'm an adult programming librarian at the Advanced Learning Library. My recommendation for Category 12, a book by an author visiting Wichita, is The Babysitter's Coven by Kate Williams who visited Wichita this past June. This book is the first of a young adult fantasy trilogy. It has been described as the Babysitter's Club meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I couldn't think of a more apt description. The story is set in a small Kansas town. The main character, Esme, a high school junior, has her rather mundane life turned turned upside down when strange things begin happening around her. And then a new girl comes to town who asks her to join her babysitting club, which isn't even much of a babysitting club to begin with. With this new friendship, Esme discovers that there is more than meets the eye with this strange new girl, and that they both share a connection to unanswered questions about her mother, who was institutionalized under mysterious circumstances when she was little. Soon she is pulled into a bizarre new world she never knew existed, where she's called to protect not only the children she babysits, but also her new friend and even the quiet little town she calls home. This was a very fun, lighthearted read, despite some occasionally heavy moments. I loved the 90s nostalgic feel to the book, which will please many of our Gen X and millennial listeners. I found myself laughing a lot. I loved the author's witty way of describing things. For example, this passage. I talk a lot of crap on Kansas, but backwards politics and lack of good shopping options aside, it's pretty okay sometimes. Like now. The sky is huge and close, as if you could touch it. If you just found the right tree to climb, and the landscape is as subtle as no makeup makeup. There are no mountains intimidating you into appreciating them, and there's no ocean throwing itself on rocks to demand your attention. The plains are just like, we're here and we're chill. This has been my recommendation for Category 12, a book by an author visiting Wichita in 2022. For more reading recommendations, visit wichitalibrary.org slash read ICT. Hello there, my name is Katie and I am in the Collection Development Division of the Library. This is my recommendation for Category 12, a book by an author visiting Wichita. I chose the book Life on the Mississippi by Rinker Buck, who visited Wichita last August. Rinker Buck has lots of curiosity and imagination. In his previous book, The Oregon Trail, he built a covered wagon and attempted to follow the Oregon Trail. In this book, he's decided to go down the Mississippi on a flatboat, trying to replicate Mark Twain's book, Life on the Mississippi. He does a tremendous amount of research before embarking on this journey. He builds a flatboat, and he hires a motley crew of people to help him on this trip. As he makes his way down the Mississippi, he brings us along for an adventurous ride. We are there as he learns to navigate the Mississippi. We learn about a piece of history that has been forgotten but was crucial in its day. The role of the flatboat came about when farmers realized that it would be more profitable for them to transport goods down the river to New Orleans rather than going overland even though the journey would take months. The river became a superhighway. Not only is this a history of flatboating, it is also a book about economics, geography, and nature. 
You read how he learned to captain a a flatboat, manipulating around larger boats. He also learned about the hazards of submerged trees, floater logs, sandbars, and how low water could ground a boat. You learn about the industries which used to dominate the river and that are disappearing with the changes in energy production. Coal production has made way for other forms of energy and the plants that used to be on the river are closing and disappearing along with the jobs. We also learn how the banks of the Mississippi constantly changes as water flows through it. Over time, the river has changed its course. He watched nature up close and personal and observes that man is an invader of nature's space. This is a leisurely book about a more leisurely lifestyle. Just as you can't be in too much of a hurry when floating down the river, I encourage you to read this book at a leisurely pace. I will leave you with Rinker Buck's own words. He described his river journey as hypnotic, with the sun on his face and the murmuring of the water against the side of the boat, making him feel lazy, romantic, freed from the bonds of land. I hope you will take time to read this book about a fascinating piece of American history. This has been my recommendation for Category 12, and for more recommendations, visit wichitalibrary.org slash read ICT. Sarah, it was really awesome to talk with Silas and uh, talk about Lark Ascending, which honestly was one of my favorite books of the year. Yes, I thought it was so great, and it's really kind of a dream come true to be able to interview authors this season. Um, I do feel like maybe we were a little bit heavy on the fan girling and boying. Yeah, but just a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, uh, but luckily Zoom separated us. So. <laughs> A list of the books discussed in today's episode can be found in the accompanying show notes. To request any of the books heard about in today's episodes, visit wichitalibrary.org or call us at 316-261-8500. To end out the show, staff member Ian will read a submission from our local short story program. To find out how you can submit your own work to be distributed through our short story dispensers, visit wichitalibrary.org slash short story. This is one of the many short stories and poems you can get from one of our short story dispensers located at Reverie Roasters Coffee Shop, Evergreen Community Library, and the Eisenhower Airport. Balloon by Eden Penny. Every night I reach inside and find my balloon. I whisper all my secrets in, my problems, my desires, and watch them float away until the night consumes them whole. The sun comes up, The balloon is gone, and all the words inside. Thank you to Silas House for talking with us today. We'd also like to thank Katie, Connie, and Ginny for sharing their book recommendations for Category 12, a book by an author that visited Wichita in 2022. And thanks to all of you for sticking with us through Season 2 of Read, Return, Repeat. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library, and a big thanks goes out to our production crew and podcast team. Team members include me and Daniel, but also Kelly Fabrizius, Jennifer Durham, and Ian Bailey. Ginny also makes sure we have show notes for every episode. Kyle Holly is our audio and video editing expert. Greg Nordyke handles our website and makes sure each episode comes with a transcript. And Sean Jones is our marketing specialist. To participate in the Read ICT Challenge, Please visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Stay connected with other Read ICT participants on the Read ICT Challenge Facebook page. Find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. To join the group, search hashtag Read ICT Challenge on Facebook and click join. You can follow this podcast through the Anchor app or stream episodes on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe and share it with all your friends. Categories for the 2023 challenge will be announced January 1st, 2023. We'll see you all for season three.